Thank you very much to everyone who's come in so far. We're waiting for uh, other people to admit it, and we hope to start the seminar very, very shortly. I'm just repeating, we're just waiting. The, the numbers are climbing steadily, and we're just waiting to get a few more people in. Um, very grateful to you all for signing in. So I think we'll uh, we'll get started because it's uh, it's great when people can come along on time and we don't want to be delaying the start of what we think will be a very exciting uh, seminar uh, that we're going to run this evening between now and about half past five. So we'll start now and uh, thank you very much for um, letting people in, Tom, and more are joining even as uh, uh, as we're going along. So uh, so. Welcome to you all uh, and uh, thank you for coming along to the seminar being hosted by Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. Uh, I'm the Chief Executive of Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. My name is Nolan Blackwell. Uh, and we're hosting this seminar, which is the result of research done by Dr. Susan Leahy in partnership with the centre and which we're very pleased uh, to have Dr. Leahy present here. Um, and after she has presented, we'll have a couple of short interventions uh, from a um, practicing barrister, uh, from one of our court accompaniment volunteers, and from myself. And there will also be a little uh, time, we hope, uh, for questions uh, that to be put to either Dr. Leahy or other members of the panel afterwards. You'll find that you have a Q&A button on your screen and you can use that in order to put any questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. So uh, just before uh, we bring Dr. Leahy on to present her research, uh, just a little bit about Susan Leahy, who's a senior lecturer in law at the University of Limerick. Her main interests are in the area of criminal justice with a particular emphasis on sexual violence and victims of crime and family law. Uh, she has, uh, she has a number, we have done uh, previous collaborations in Dublin Rape Crisis Centre with Susan and she has been a great friend to the centre and a great ac academic challenger to us as well in our thinking. Um, and particularly we have to credit the work that she did when, uh, when the sexual offences uh, bill and then act of 2017 was going through in terms of understanding better and having the legislation describe consent uh, in that. So she has uh, published uh, a lot uh, of um, articles in the area of consent, Irish sexual offences, and, and quite widely. She's co-authored two books, on one on sexual offending in Ireland uh, with Dr. Margaret Fitzgerald O'Reilly um, and the victim in the Irish criminal, um, just, uh, in the Irish criminal justice process. Uh, which she co-authored with Professor Shane Phil Commons, with whom she works in UL, um, and with uh, Dr. Kathleen Moore Walsh and Dr. Eva Spain. So she lectures in criminology, family law, and media law, and she's uh, a specialist diploma in that area as well. And she's the director of the BA Criminal Justice and co-director for the Centre of Crime Justice and victim studies. And I could go on, Susan, but I think we'll just hand over to you to talk a little bit about this research, which is brand new and, with, and this is its first outing. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Nolene. I'll just share my screen um, and get started. Um, so I suppose, first of all, I'd just like to thank everybody um, for coming along today um, and for their interest in this research. 
Um, and I suppose I, I, I have about 20 minutes to speak, so I, I'm, I'm going to give just a general introduction to the background, to the research, um, and to some, I suppose, information about, um, I suppose, how it came to pass and how it came to be and what I, what I hope it, 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 will, um, it will achieve. Um, so, as I said, there's a the background, the method, methodology of the research project and overview of some of the key findings. But before I start, I should thank, I suppose, most sincerely everyone at Dublin Rave Crisis Centre for not only supporting this project, but also for facilitating this webinar this evening. Um, it's been great to see so many people um, coming along to take part and hear about the findings from the research. Um, and, you know, this webinar was pulled together quite quickly and I really appreciate all of the effort that went into that. I'd also really like to talk, to thank Catherine and Leisha for coming along to, to speak along with me and give their perspective um, on some of the findings as well. So just in terms of the project itself and the people who were involved in it and who helped to make it possible. Um, first of all, it was funded by the Irish Research Council new foundation scheme. Um, and without funding like this, um, doing a project like this really, really wouldn't work because it, it does take an amount of time and there's an amount of resources that need to go in. So that funding is really, really very welcome. Um, for the purposes of the project, then um, Dublin Rape Crisis Centre were my partners. Um, and helped me to develop the project idea. It was an honor to work with them. It's always an honor to work with everyone at Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. I've learned an incredible lot um, in my career from working with um, DRCC and all the other NGOs I've had the privilege of working with as well. Um, so that's really helped me give me an insight into, into getting this project off the ground. Then in terms of support for the recruitment of participants, um, Dublin Rape Crisis Centre and Victim Support at Court helped with recruitment of court accompaniment workers. And then the Bar Council of Ireland and the Office of the DPP um, were very gracious to help me with recruitment of legal professionals. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about recruitment again in a few minutes. And above all, I want to thank, thank all of the participants for sharing their time and, the ex and their expertise and giving so willingly and so freely of their opinions um, and for you know it, it's not an easy thing to sit down with somebody with a tape recorder asking you a, a barrage of questions and I, I really appreciate um, all of the time all of these busy people gave to me. So why did I want to do the study? Um, I suppose for me a lot of what um, is important when you talk about um, sexual offences law and particularly sexual offences law reform is knowing what's actually going on on the ground, understanding I suppose what I call the realities of how the law is operating and that's why this project is called the realities of rape trials in Ireland. Unfortunately in an Irish context we are a little poor in this area, we don't have a lot of empirical research on rape trials so in other jurisdictions like England and Wales, our nearest neighbours, they have a lot of, for example, mock jury research, which shows us what, how jurors think in these trials, um, how, how they might react to certain types of laws, how they might react if the law was changed. We don't have a lot of that here in an Irish context. There are some excellent research studies. Um, Ivana Batchik and some others did, did a wonderful work back in 1998, comparing different jurisdictions and their responses. Um, and how and to to rape and and different rape trials, how they run in different jurisdictions. Um, Lean's study in two thousand and one contained a component which was quite like this project, which was talking to different professionals involved in trials and involved in the investi investigation and prosecution of sexual offence cases. Um, but again, you know, that was back in 2001, it's some time ago. And then Rape and Justice in Ireland, of course, by Hanley and colleagues in association with Rape Crisis Network of, of Ireland. That was a groundbreaking study and a massive undertaking looking at attrition and key points of attrition. Um, but that's where it stopped really. We don't have a lot of other information about what how people how the people in the system think about what it's working and how for example things like juries um, are thinking in these cases so that's the gap I was trying to trying to fill here so just in terms of the method and I'll step quickly through this obviously I had to get ethical approval from my university to go and speak to everybody everybody complete who took part and um, did so on the basis of giving informed consent beforehand all interviews were audio recorded Again, with consent, they were transcribed verbatim and then analysed. 
all participants took part on the basis of guaranteed anonymity. So anyone referred to in the study is only referred to by a pseudonym. So LP for legal professionals or AW for complement workers. And I have removed absolutely anything that might identify any participant, any victim, any defendant, any case. There's nothing in the report which can identify anybody um, in particular. So as I mentioned already, the participants were recruited with the support of Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, Victim Support at Court, the Bar Council of Ireland and the Office of the DPP. With our legal professionals in particular, there was a certain element, I suppose, of what we call snowball sampling in that some would refer me to colleagues who might be interested in participating um, and everyone who potentially might be interested was contacted, but in, took part in, in a totally voluntary basis in which they wanted to, if they wanted to participate, they could. So we use semi-structured, I, I use semi-structured interviews. So there was an interview guide, same questions asked everybody, different people uh, responded differently, I suppose give more detail on, on, on some questions than others, but all questions looked at procedures relating to rape trials and the participants' own views on reform. Those interviews were conducted between June and September 2019. Um, a significant amount of them were conducted in person or conducted in person. Some were on the phone. One was um, a written questionnaire returned to me. And in total, I had 12 accompaniment workers and 16 legal professionals. Just a couple of caveats before I step you through just some of the findings I'm going to talk to you about today. And I can only take you through some of them, but I'm happy to speak to any of the others in question time as well. The findings of the report here and the recommendations for reform, that they represent the views of the participants in the project. I'm not saying that they are the views of everybody who's a legal professional or everybody who's an accompanying worker um, who works in this area. Obviously, I only spoke to who I spoke to, so this is the views of these people only. Um, but you will see there are commonalities in, in their perspectives, which suggests that they, they are fairly authoritative in terms of how the system is working. The other thing to mention is that the recommendations for reform are also based on the participants' views. Um, so these aren't necessarily the views of Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, although, although there will be instances where DRCC will agree with some of the recommendations that are made. There's probably areas where even I myself might have gone further. Um, and in the written report, when you take a look at it, you, you, you'll, I'll see I will have maybe highlighted where maybe I think reform could go further than some of the participants have suggested. Um, so it's very much what what these people thought about from their perspective on the system. So the key themes that are covered in the report are consent, the use of judicial directions in guiding jurors in these trials. And these are two of the things I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon. I also asked about sexual experience evidence and counselling records and legal representation for complainants. There's a lot of detail in, in those aspects that I won't go into in this presentation, but I'm happy to take questions on. And the final thing is delay. And the reason I wanted to speak to delay a little bit um, was I thought the responses on this were particularly telling. And as an academic who has not worked within trials herself, though I was aware of delay, possibly wasn't aware necessarily of how problematic um, delay still is in the system um, and the need to tackle that, that it's not just about tackling laws here, it's about tackling processes and procedures in the system itself as well. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is consent. So Nolene in her introduction mentioned that we, ha we, we have a new definition of consent, well relatively new now, it's, it's been in place since 2017, which introduced into section 9 of the 1990 Criminal Law Rape, Rape Act a two-tier defin definition of consent. So that first tier states that a person consents to a sexual act if he or she freely and voluntarily agrees to engage in that act. And then in the second tier, there's a list of situations where consent will be deemed to be absent. Um, so um, we, I won't read all of those out. Um, they largely replicate what was there at common law already. But I suppose for, for me as an academic, and for groups like Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, the significance of a definition of consent is that it was the state for the first time taking positive action to say what consent means in our jurisdiction, what it means in our law. Um, so for me, it was it was a big step forward. And I was very interested to see what was happening on the ground with it um, and what, what those involved in the system thought about the definition of consent. 
So in terms of timelines, that definition commenced on the 27th of March 2017, with my interviews taking place between June and September um, 2019. So one of the things that struck me, um, and I knew it, this would possibly be the case, was that although the, the definition had commenced um, two years prior to the interviews, legal professionals didn't have experience of it to date. And that shows that, again, delay in these cases that, you know, cases that had happened or incidents that had occurred post March 2017 were still not coming before the courts. So it's a very, really, really important caveat here in my findings on this, that I suppose the anyone I spoke to was speaking having not um, used the definition of consent in a trial process yet. But that said, there was still an ambivalence about its likely impact, particularly on the part of legal professionals. So here are some quotes from legal professionals on the definition of consent and its likely impact. So when they're asked what the impact might be, I don't think so, not hugely, because it is what it is. There's more words to be used in explaining it to a jury, but I think people have an idea in their own heads as to what is involved in consent. So they could listen to the words, but I don't know that the expanded definition will make a huge difference. Personally, I don't think it moves the matter backwards or forwards enormously. So what impact will it have? I'm not too sure that it will have an enormous impact, except I suppose it just emphasizes that there isn't a gray area on those particular things. So it's not that I think it extends anything. I just think it makes things a little crisper. The accompanying workers, again, um, didn't really, um, hadn't had experience of the definition um, in, in trials, obviously, because they were in the same situation as the legal professionals. But what was very interesting in the perspective from the accompanying workers is that they spoke particularly about what consent means to um, complainants, what it means to them, um, having their own idea of what it means as they proceed to a trial. But also <clears throat> the, how important it is that societal understandings of consent are appropriate and are properly informed. So there's a, a couple of quotes on that. I think there's a lot more issues surrounding consent than just the legal definition. I don't think that just by defining consent that automatically that's meaning that all jurors that you will fully understand or overcome their own biases surrounding that area as well. It's a very small part of the overall reforms that need to be enacted. People that I accompany have a great sense of what consent is to them, maybe not the actual lawful definition of it, but what consent is and their kind of taking it is. So drawing on that and some conclusions and recommendations based on what I found there, well, one of the, the, the first things was what I knew already, that a definition of consent on its own in legislation isn't just going to lead to spontaneous changes, that more is needed to support it, that more is needed to make sure juries understand, first of all, the significance of a new definition of consent, but also that underlying issues like preconceived ideas about sexual offences or victims of sexual offences, so-called rape myths, don't continue to impact on consent. We also know that societal understandings of consent are just as important as legal understandings. And what I thought was quite interesting with the feedback from the accompanying workers is again something that I've thought about recently is that I suppose they felt that younger people had a much better idea of what consent was or what was involved in it than maybe older generations. And that maybe says something about our, our education and awareness initiatives as well. Are we targeting them effectively at all age cohorts and at all demographic groupings in society? Not only as a preventative measure, but also because any age group can find themselves on a jury in a, in a rape trial as well. So we need to make sure that everybody fully understands what consent is. And this all links then as well to my next recommendation is that when jurors are in trials, how do we make sure they understand the new definition of consent? So I asked um, all of the participants about using judicial directions um, in trials um, and, cop and, and, and I suppose maybe mirroring what is known as the Crown Court Compendium in England and Wales. And that is a publication which contains a list of model or sample directions which a judge can use in a sexual offence trial to guide jurors on things like consent, but also on things like um, preconceived ideas they might have about what a real rape might look like, what, uh, how a genuine victim 
might behave or react in certain situations. So I provided participants with an, a sample from the Crown Court compendium um, and asked them to read it and then to give me their view on two things. One, whether they thought that the guidance like this would be useful in an Irish situation, so whether we should introduce some sort of bench book guidance like this for our judges, and two, if we were to introduce it, when should such guidance be given? Should it be given at the start of the trial, at the end of a trial, or both? So I'm going to read this to you because I think it is worthwhile to see what the guidance is like. So this is about avoiding assumptions about rape. It will be understandable if some of you came to this trial with assumptions about rape. You may have ideas about what kind of person is a victim of rape or what kind of person is a rapist. You may also have ideas about what a person will do or say when they are raped. But it is important that you dismiss these ideas when you decide this case. From experience, we know there's no typical rape, typical rapist or typical person that is raped. Rape can take place in almost any circumstance. It can happen between all different kinds of people and people who are raped react in a variety of different ways. So you must put aside any assumptions you have about rape. All of you in this jury must make your judgment based only on the evidence you hear from the witnesses and the laws I explained that to you. So there was no significant resistance amongst any of the participants to using this type of direction in Ireland. You had most legal professionals happy to see something like this being introduced. But where they differed was where such um, direction should be given, whether it should be given at the beginning or the end or both. So just to give you a, a, a brief overview of some of the things the legal professional said, um, there was a feeling that at the start, while it could be beneficial, it could also be problematic because we don't, at the start of a trial, you don't yet know what the arguments are going to be, what evidence will be adduced or in what way by the defence, so that you may not know what you're going to be challenging. There was concerns as well about potential prejudice to the defendant, that whatever was used would have to be very carefully couched. And again, that's why I think model directions are useful because it gives a nice template for a judge to direct in a relatively dispassionate way. But some of the legal professionals did speak about as well the fact that if it, if we wait until the end, well then the evidence has been heard against a backdrop of belief, whatever beliefs people may have come in with. So it, it may be difficult for them to autocorrect later on. Some legal professionals also felt that if their guidance was to be given at the start, then it might be effective if it was given by prosecution counsel and not by the judge. Um, the majority of the court accompaniment workers felt that guidance should be given at the beginning and the end of the trial. And they very much give a layperson's perspective on all of this and the amount of evidence or information that's put before you in a trial um, and how it can be hard to retain guidance from the start to the end. And that's evidenced in some of the in some of the quotes here from the from the participants. So I have a one quote from a legal professional, excuse me, and one from a court accompaniment worker. It would be no harm to re reiterate it at the end of the trial, because sometimes people look absolutely terrified when they sit in the jury box. It's a fairly intimidating scenario if you're not used to it. So I would think probably to repeat it. And what harm in repeating it again to reiterate it? It could be three weeks later. And from an accompaniment worker, I certainly think that in the beginning, because I mean, are we going to ask people to question their beliefs at the beginning of a trial? Or are we going to shoehorn it into the end? We're going to say, look, this is a sexual violence center and that brings violence case and it brings with us a, lo a lot of issues. And perhaps you've never thought about what a rape victim looks like, but they don't behave a certain way. They don't look a certain way. So my recommendations based on this, I think there is um, support there broadly for a bench book guidance similar to the Crown Court Compendium, and that that should have suitable sample directions for judges to use in sexual offence trials um, throughout Ireland and, and to use in all different types of sexual offence cases, not just rape trials. Who do I think would create it? I think it would be a very suitable um, project for the Judicial Council. Um, and I think it could be drawn up in consultation then with experts, professionals, stakeholders in the area, Ideally, I suppose what you'd like to see as well is it being tested in front of something like a mock jury to see that it's landing correctly. But the Crown Court Compendium in itself provides an excellent, tem excellent template for what it might look like. The timing of such directions is something that would need to be considered. For me, when you unpick everything that was said, 
um, in the interviews, there is a strong case for at least some guidance at the beginning of trials. And what I would suggest is that some general guidance at the beginning of a trial, perhaps on what consent means, a general instruction like avoiding assumptions, designed in consultation in each case with prosecution and defense, defense counsel would make sure that at the least at the end, at the start, there was some guidance to keep jurors on the right track. Then afterwards, coming towards the end of the trial, to remind jurors of that guidance, but then maybe room for more specific guidance relating to delay and complaint um, or other aspects um, of the, the case which are pinned on specific aspects of evidence. There'd be space for that at the end. Whatever we do, if we introduce bench book guidance, it should be accompanied with training so that we get the best use of it, so that legal professionals and judges involved in these cases can see how we can make best use of this type of guidance to make sure that it is useful um, in cases. And the final thing I'll talk about is delay, and I hope I'm doing OK in time. Um, delay came in as something I didn't go into the interviews um, intending to Find, get findings on. I was aware of the delays in the system. I've worked in this area for long enough to know about them. But what I found very telling was that I asked everybody who took part at the end to tell me about an issue with the system that I had not raised with them or something that troubled them. And delay was the most commonly cited problem raised by both accompaniment workers and legal professionals. And it was highlighted by a majority of the legal professionals and by all accompaniment workers. And I think some of the quotes on delay um, put it far better than I could um, in terms of the problem that it raises in the system. So one of our legal professionals, I think that if the public were properly, properly aware of the delay, I think it would be like a national outrage. People are waiting years for cases. It's almost an acceptance that if a rape trial is listed for the first time, that it's not going to get on. You have to explain to a complainant that this is the date your trial is set, but you know it may not start on that day. You know they come ready for a trial and it doesn't get on. It's put off for six months. That's really terrible. It's really terrible. And this quote from one of our accompaniment workers is, is very, I think really sums it up really well, the challenges, both practical and emotional for um, complainants when there is a delay or an adjournment in their trial. So some people coming in from the country, they have a full expectation they're going to book accommodation somewhere for 10 days and be here. And then you say to them, you've got to go home, it's adjourned. That's really difficult. It's very difficult because then you are just adding another level of distress to it. They've applied for time off work. They've told their family they're coming. And the accompanying workers in particular, their feedback on this is that people are waiting and waiting um, to give their evidence and they're holding on um, very much, try, making sure everything is, 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 is in the forefront of their minds. They give their best evidence and healing is, is put on hold until they have given their evidence. So the wait and the delay and the uncertainty that comes along with that um, compounds the trauma um, in, in these trials. So for me, I think it's great to see the Criminal Procedure Act 2021 um, having been enacted, I hope it will be commenced soon and, and the legal professionals and court accompaniment workers I spoke to all spoke to the need for pre-trial hearings to make sure that any potential for adjournments or delays at the start of or during trials um, can be offset. The Gillen Review in Northern Ireland um, spoke very meaningfully about delay um, and talked about some things that need to be need to happen to avoid delay in that jurisdiction, which I think are important here too. Um, and I think it has to become uh, the norm that there is, as the Gillen Review suggests, mandatory early proactive communication and engagement between the parties in these cases. And that's not simple. These cases are very complex. There's a lot of evidence involved. There's a lot of disclosure issues involved, even more so than I would have realized before I did these interviews. Um, and there's also maybe space for a cultural change as well. It was really heartening that all of the practitioners and the people involved in the system were aware of the delay, but we need to get to a place where we refuse to accept delay as part of the process and to actively challenge it at every hand's turn. And I hope pre-trial hearings, adequate resourcing will, will assist with that. 
So just in terms of concluding, and, and I suppose for me, what's really important is in doing work like this, that it doesn't become just highlighting all the bad aspects of the system. Because what really struck me, and having worked in this area, um, I first started writing about sexual offences back in 2007, is the changes in the area. And many practitioners, um, both court accompaniment workers and legal professionals alike, wanted to emphasize to me, and I think it would do them a disservice not to highlight that, particularly in this presentation, the changes and the improvements we've had in the system. So, you know, now with our CCJ complex, um, there is there are wonderful victim support facilities. There's the wonderful court accompaniment workers to support complainants as they give their evidence. There was great feedback on the initiatives that have come up about, particularly since the implementation of the Victims Directive in this jurisdiction, Divisional Protective Service units within Angarda Siakana, and the general day to day work Angarda Siakana do in answering questions complainants have, particularly as they go through the trial process. Um, was highlighted and then the wonderful work being done by the office of the DPP as well in pre-trial familiarization visits a wealth of leaflets and information they provide to complainants throughout the process and um, all of our wonderful NGOs supporting our, our complainants and victims on, on a daily basis and then obviously the wonderful work being done by the legal aid board as well and um, providing legal representation for complainants in um, applications for sexual history or counselling records. For me, there's a need for further legal change, and it's great to see the O'Malley review and the implementation plans in relation to it, and I hope they'll proceed swiftly. Um, but extra legal measures are just as important. Bench book guidance at this stage is as important as any further um, legislative guidance on consent, for example. And above all, what I've hoped this has shown is that how we need further empirical research um, in Ireland. We need to, to have studies like court observation studies, um, jury research. That's the best way to understand how our system is actually operating. This study in itself, having the perspective of people has, who work in the system shows us that much change has happened and there's more that needs to be done. Thankfully, it supports a lot of the initiatives that are ongoing, but it also highlights some gaps that maybe we haven't thought about um, effectively yet. But if we had more information about how these trials are operating, we could do a lot better work, both in testing new laws before we implement them, but also in, in, in seeing whether what we've done already has worked. So that's my thoughts for now. And I hope people will find the report useful. I um, hope I haven't gone too over time and I'll pass back to Nolene. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Susan. Uh, I can't start my video. Uh, okay, so I can start my video now. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yeah, uh, th this is such an important piece of work because it definitely is that different perspective that we didn't have before on the system. And undoubtedly we can, uh, we, we need this kind of um, view and we need that further research. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have a few words to say myself uh, in a little while, but I want to uh, introduce and bring on to the screen as well uh, two other people who will briefly comment on this excellent uh, work. And I should say two things. First of all is the, uh, the report will be available on our website after this seminar. So drcc.ie, it will be on the front page of the website on one of the sliders, so people can access it. And a little briefing note uh, that our wonderful Yvonne Woods has done as well. Uh, so that will be helpful. And I see people have started to use the Q&A um, uh, button to, to put in comments or questions. We'll take a look at those after. Uh, we've had brief comments from Leisha Duffy and, um, and, and from uh, Catherine McGillicuddy as well, who I, I think is coming on the screen as well. So uh, we're going to take three short comments, first of all, Susan, uh, but thank you for that, uh, for that excellent overview. But I have to say, having read the report, uh, you couldn't do justice to it in 20 minutes. It's readable um, and it's not too long and it's well worth reading for anyone interested in the topic. So, uh, so Leisha, um, uh, Leisha Duffy is one of our most experienced court accompaniment volunteers with Dublin Rape Crisis Centre um, and is an absolute star. And I have to say, um, it also gives me a chance to recognise the work of volunteers uh, done in the centre as well. And, and Leisha definitely is one of our star turns. Leisha, could I maybe just ask you to do a brief intervention 
on the topic and on the work you do in, in court accompaniment as well. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Nolene. Uh, first of all, I familiarise the victims, I'll call them victims, the clients, whatever, uh, with the court, uh, show them around the court, do logistical stuff, tell them practical stuff like putting their phones on silent and uh, help them out with during the court case. Sometimes there are various issues as in, I, I was actually came from court today, but um, the defendant uh, doesn't have to give evidence. For instance, the um, person I was with thought, yes, this person will trip themselves up and when they're being cross-examined, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they actually don't have to give, take the stand. And the judge says that at a later stage. Little points like that. Um, there, there are breaks, jury breaks. This, um, this is quite normal. Should there be any points of law to be discussed, the jury are asked to leave the courtroom. Everybody leaves. And sometimes they, these are the sort of things we do. That's why I'm explaining this. But um, we, I just tell the uh, people I'm with that it is quite normal. It has nothing to do with your evidence. Nothing, you have done nothing wrong. It's just that the legal people want to discuss points of law and um, they feel they've done something wrong. The um, Susan said there about the juries, how juries think in other jurisdictions. Now, people say, I wonder what the jury are thinking. I would love to see something like that here, that we have a facility here that can show us, uh, guide us and say, how do, how do juries react? What do they think? Because you can see from the body language sometimes of jurors that they're absorbing something or somebody is upset, a juror is upset for something that said, it would be great also if, should the, if the judges or the legal people gave direction to the jurors. At the beginning, I think personally, I think at the beginning and at the end, because sometimes they're not quite clear. For instance, today, Jurors came back after every session with questions to the judge and the judge then clarified all these things. Some of these things could have been, had they been given some sort of guidance in advance, they may have known um, that would have answered, as Susan said, that would have answered the questions to the jurors. They wouldn't have had to come back with several questions after every break. And bench guidance, I think would be good at the beginning, and again, I think at the end. And if there's anything anybody would like to ask me at the questions and session, I'd be delighted to answer. Nisha, thanks a million. Uh, and, and it's great, I mean, that's that's the kind of recommendation that uh, having seen so many trials and the rest of it, you can say, this is something that genuinely would make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'm going to invite Catherine McGillicuddy uh, to, to make her intervention. Catherine is a practicing barrister, very knowledgeable in this area as well. Um, and Catherine, do you have, could you give us a brief reaction perhaps to Susan's report? Um, yes, uh, first of all, I would echo what Nolene said. It is very readable. It's very accessible. It's a really interesting report. I enjoyed reading it. It was not a chore. It is not so long that you can't say divide it up and do it over a couple of sessions because it's divided up in quite accessible and bite-sized chunks. So really as reports go, I would highly recommend it and commend it. It is a fantastic piece of work. And everybody who took part, especially Susan, should be just, I really appreciate your time and value the, the expertise that went into it. I should say I'm not one of the legal practitioners who responded to it. I fell into that category of lawyer who felt that I didn't have experience of the new definition of consent, so I ruled myself out. And then when I read the report, I was almost laughing to myself to see that my colleagues had proceeded to answer the questionnaire, even though they hadn't seen it in practice either. And that is a reflection, as Susan says, of the delay. And just to give people a flavour of that, I myself have had three rape cases in or around the last six months, all adjourned um, because they were the first time in 
um, the accused person in all three cases was on bail and the cases that are adjourned. Some of that is a reflection on the effect of COVID because in the Central Criminal Court, you have obviously murder cases and in murder cases, possibly, although I don't think it's a hard and fast rule, but you might have more people in custody tending to wait for those type of cases than you will in rape or sexual offences. And as a result, those custody cases tend to get priority. Um, so that, that is a feature of our system for a long time and maybe even more so at the moment. I prosecute and defend and I also have acted as a separate legal representative in respect of sexual experience issues in the past. And I have seen in practice all of the points that Susan has made that the delay affects the accused person and the complainant. It really is a case of justice delayed, it's justice denied. And I was particularly struck by the comment in the report that said that there was one person, or I think a court accompanying person had pointed out that they remembered a complainant who had delayed getting counselling until the trial was over. For, for various different reasons, but partially as a protective mechanism for themselves. And I found that just on a personal level, very sad that a person would delay a process that may be of benefit to them in terms of, you know, a long term recovery, if that's the right word, um, because they wanted to do the trial first and the trial then is delayed several times. There's something wrong with that picture. And um, I think really we will need more judges is a number one thing there, more judges, more courtrooms. I know the cases are spreading around the country, but really until we have judges who are available to take up the cases, the del delay will form a feature of it. Um, in respect of the definition of consent, one thing that I would love to see is what judges make of the, the new definition. Obviously, they're not part of this research. That's not a criticism by any means. But in terms of engaging the Judicial Council going forward, I would love to see a similar type of questionnaire used with them because they are the ones who charge the jury, who tell the jury about the law. And it seems to me that the statutory definition is of assistance because it means that judges don't have to root around for their own kind of formula of words. They now have this crisp statutory um, definition that they can rely on. Also, um, I would be interested to hear what the Gardaí make of it. I'm thinking of one case that I was involved in several years ago where a complainant um, made a statement to the Gardaí and the Gardaí forgot to uh, include in her statement a line saying she did not consent to what, what had taken place. Um, and it involved in going back to her and obviously all of these cases are, are deeply traumatic but on the scale of them, there were particularly difficult aspects to what had happened to her, which meant going back, I'm sure, was very difficult for her. So um, I would like to know what the guardie make of it. Is it a benefit for them almost as a checklist in taking a statement that they are reminded of the importance of consent? What is consent? What isn't? If, for example, the, the complainant says she was asleep, then that, that speaks for itself, there is no consent. But, but say, for example, particularly in relationship or, or where there had been a, a previous relationship between the parties, to get that included, that there was no consent on this occasion. Um, in respect of um, the, the things like the counselling records uh, issue that Susan deals with in the report and the separate legal representation, one thing that I was struck with was about was whether we could join up our thinking between the sexual offences legislation and the, the law on sexual, uh, separate legal representatives with the Victims of Crime Act. So, for example, there's right to information provisions under the Section 7 and 8 of the Victims of Crime Act. It seems to me that perhaps disclosure uh, or the potential for disclosure, for example, of your phone details should be something that is included in the victims of crime legislation so that complainants are aware of that from the get go. Similarly, I know that Susan touches uh, in respect of the sexual experience, whether um, perhaps, you know, your your mobile phone or perhaps your maybe if you were on dating apps online, if these were things that would form part of your sexual experience. And it seems to me that that ties in with the provisions under Section 21 of the Victims of Crime Act. Um, and 
it strikes me or has struck me that um, there's no right to separate legal representation where questioning is sought in respect of your private life. Perhaps the provisions could dovetail. And uh, if there's some, I think in practice, what we tend to see is if an issue about phones or or, or let's say dating apps came up, most sensible practitioners will seek leave of the trial judge on the basis that it could fall within the broad term of sexual experience, which is not currently defined, and they will seek leave to ask it. But it would seem to me to be preferable if these things were done on a more, um, I suppose, structured basis. And this is something that Susan touches on and makes very practical solutions. And, and some of the, of the recommendations that Susan makes should be very easy to implement and hopefully will be done. For example, she makes the point that there should be a time limit um, introduced for um, applications for leave to cross-examine a complainant on their sexual experience. I, I completely endorse that view personally. I, I don't speak for anybody else, just myself. But it seems to me that in a world where defence practitioners must say, for example, serve an expert report on the prosecution 10 days before a trial under the provisions of the Criminal Procedure Act 2010, that they should equally be thinking about their case in a sexual type of case and saying to themselves, look, there's a statutory time limit here. Is this something we want to explore? And we need to put the prosecution on notice of this now so that complainants are aware of it in advance of the trial and get to see a, a, a lawyer before the trial date. Um, I know there's uh, provisions about whether a senior counsel, whether it should be the same level of representation. I, I'm open-minded on that personally. I would like to see a situation where if a complainant has had a counselling records type of application and later a sexual experience type of application, perhaps the complainant would benefit from continuity in terms of representation. And also, um, where representation is required for one or both of those issues, there is no statutory right on the part of the legal representatives to the book of evidence, to disclosure. You are entirely relying on the DPP's office, who tend to be very good, by the way, but you're relying on them for information. And if you're lucky and like me, you work in the area and you can find out who the barristers are prosecuting and defending the case, you can get a lot of information very quickly, but you are relying on goodwill and that should not be the case. It should be more structured as a regime. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, pass it to wind up here now so that yes. I can speak, <laughs> but also so we can do the questions whenever. Do you, do you want to finish up or do you? No, that's it. I'll leave it up there. I could no, I think that was, a, that was a great note. And all I can say is I'm glad this is being recorded because we're going to need to take down some of that and talk to you about it again into the future. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments myself and then I'll move to the questions. Um, and answer if that's all right, uh, questions and answers, but thank you very much for that. Um, and some of the uh, issues that I want to raise are pretty well on the same grounds that uh, particularly that Catherine has spoken about, but in terms of consent, one of the um, one of the core things that, uh, that Susan Leahy's report shows is that, that there's a, a need for a wider recognition of what actually constitutes consent, uh, because it's important for, you know, healthy sexual relationships, it's important for equality, and it's also important because we need to be certain that all those involved in investigating, prosecuting, defending, making decisions in criminal trials, including juries, that they all have much the same understanding, and that's not uniformly clear. So as the court accompaniment workers said, there is a need for a wider awareness raising. Dublin Rape Crisis Centre is looking to go into a long-term campaign uh, where we actually spend uh, time just working with uh, with all of our society to try and build uh, more of a consensus around the realities of consent. Um, also that question of judicial guidance to juries that uh, Leisha spoke about, I, I suppose it's very bold of me to say, but I'm not in practice anymore, so I can say, I think, uh, it might not only be necessary for the juries, it may be useful to have some sort of templates which would inform uh, the legal personnel in a trial um, 
including the judges, who are all part of society and may therefore be party to many of the uh, misconceptions that there are about what is and is not consensual sexual activity. Um, and also as a, a something to whet your appetite to, re to read the report, Susan also makes some really important points around how in terms of consent, we also need to be looking at, at coercion being the opposite of consent, not just force, not just being asleep, uh, not just being so intoxicated that you can't give consent. And um, in terms of what Catherine was talking about and sexual experience evidence, one of the things that the report says is that the legal professions and indeed the court accompaniment uh, people were generally of the view that the current rules in this area were working well um, and, and that evidence of sexual experience is only introduced where it's genuinely relevant. Uh, she does make the point about it would be useful to um, analyze case files. And this is something that has been on our back burner for a long time. Um, and uh, there'll be people at this seminar whom we will need to get back to about that to try and advance it. Uh, but actually, uh, the question of sexual experience evidence is very contentious because, for instance, in a study led by the academic and barrister Senator Ivana Bacic back in 2010, commissioned by DRCC at that time, uh, it found that 70% of rape suspects who wish to use the victim's sexual experience in the defense were granted permission to do so. So that's not saying everyone applied to it, but of those who did apply, 70% uh, were granted permission. And of those, half of them were applying for it on the basis that the victim was promiscuous. Uh, the other half were on the basis that there had been previous consensual sexual activity with the victims. So there is, uh, there was a sense at that time that judges grant defense applications frequently enough um, and with relative ease. And I think that is something in such an area where there is such interference with the private life of uh, the victim, uh, if it's not if it's not narrowly defined. I think uh, that's one of the areas that much more research is needed. Um, uh, and in the same way, uh, and I see there are questions in, uh, about counselling records, um, I'll, I'll be coming back to those, uh, but we would have a real question as to why it is necessary at all for evidence, and that's something that has to be, um, I, I think, really interrogated well now. Why in this area of crime alone it, does somebody look for that external evidence of counselling um, recommendations? Uh, we also, and just this will be my final point, but it is one of my hobby horses, so I'm going to get it in when I have the chance. Um, and I'm glad to see the O'Malley review recommendation repeated that the, uh, the complainant should be legally represented throughout questioning on sexual experience. Um, and while we reckon, this is probably one of the areas where we would go further than uh, the recommendations uh, suggested by the research, um, because uh, people, uh, in both the, both the court complement people and the legal practitioners seem to think that it would cause unnecessary complications and that the system worked as it does. Well, I'm not sure about that because it looks that like it only works like that if you have a two party system, the prosecution and the defense. There really is a third party, as Catherine was saying now, in the, in the mix, and that is the victim with statutory rights, with Human, fundamental human rights and their rights are not being uh, well represented in this way. Um, and when you look back on it, it, it has been things evolve over time in law. And until the 19th century, there was no need, it seemed, to give the accused a right to counsel. Until the middle of the 20th century, there was no need to give the accused access to legal aid if they couldn't afford their own lawyer. Now we take those things for granted. Um, but I don't think we need to wait another half a century in order to make sure that victims uh, have their rights vindicated. So we would see a need for um, more representation. And, um, and just my final point is there is such a need for um, a court reporter of some sort now, court observation. And that is something that we could set up reasonably easily, I think. So, um, so, so there's something we could think about quite quickly because we know so little about trials. So I'm going to turn briefly if, if I have everybody, uh, if I have Susan and Catherine and Leisha 
in on the um, on the call, which I think I do. Uh, here we are. I'm going to throw a couple of questions your various ways. A couple of them relate to delay. Um, and one, uh, one of the questionnaires says, having spent many years investigating serious sexual offences in other jurisdictions, I cannot find any real answers as to the delays in sexual offences getting to trial in Ireland. My personal experience from investigations of this nature, from the point of complaint to, to the point of trial was usually 12 months, and Ireland has a long way to go to meet that mark, is, is one practitioner's view. And somebody else asked, what reasons are given for the delays in starting trials? And I don't know, uh, Susan, do you want to take that uh, first? Uh, yeah, so um, I suppose for me, the, the the feedback I got in relation to delay, a lot of it came back to issues like disclosure, to issues like applications coming up or evidence coming to, to light close to the start of a trial, um, which meant that, you know, some of that we've now, we're now aware that this document exists and we need to we need to go and find it um, there were some issues around resourcing so some people just mentioned just not having enough courtrooms and and just not having enough judges um, there was no real clear defined reason why um, um, the delay happens and I think Catherine touched on it really well when she talked about the fact that a lot of people did mention as well where you have a defendant on bail that there's a sense that it, it can be adjourned um, more easily um, and I suppose that's one thing I thought about the report the delay is to everyone's disadvantage it's, it's, it's a benefit to nobody in the system um, it's it's the, it's obviously highly traumatic for complainants but also for defendants and for people who work in the system as well I imagine it's very difficult to have these cases lingering on on and on um, so resources and issues around disclosure and particularly what people what the like legal pr practitioners were talking to me about was disclosure becoming a much bigger issue now because of mobile phones and all of the data that's on them and and this sense that we need to know everything that's on a phone which brings us back I think to your point Nolene of relevance so I got no clear answer but they were some of the points that were raised. Okay so I'm going to because we only have a couple of minutes left so I'm going to throw a couple of more and um, there's some specifically directed at, at research Susan mm -hmm. so um, uh, and, and a lot of nice compliments as well but is there any research in England and Wales on the impact of judicial directions in relation to uh, myths and misconceptions so this point that you know where, where the judicial direction would help rebalance myths. yeah um, there is um, so there's for people who are interested I suppose two of the main academics in the UK who've done work on mock juries would be Professor Vanessa Monroe and Professor Louise Ellison um, and they've done things like testing how directions land with jurors for example you know with a mock jury how it works is you have different um, same uh, mock trial that's played out and then they watch jurors deliberate what's interesting is actually that sometimes that the in the attitudes can be so ingrained that even a direction doesn't cut through them which which shows how needed they are i think but yeah there is guidance and um there is i suppose research on them um and and how and how they can be effective yeah and another question on research uh, is are you aware of any research into the decision-making processes of the DPP as to whether they'll proceed with a sexual assault case? Oh, now that's a that's a tricky one, <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. the only study on, on on kind of touching on that would be rape and justice in Ireland in two thousand and nine, from when they did look at the key points of attrition. So there's three strands to that to, to that um, research. One looking at why people report or don't to looking at to a certain extent DPP decision making or at least the types of cases that are proceeding or not and then the trials themselves but again I suppose it's very very difficult for the office of the DPP um, to take part in some of those types of research as well because they have to be very careful in terms of GDPR and, and, and right to fair trial and all of that. Um, and a, a practical question then from as, as and the sort of practical question that's useful. Um, who funds that kind of research in other jurisdictions? And is it something that the Department of Justice or the Law Reform Commission might do here? It'd be wonderful if the Department of Justice or the Law Reform Commission did it here. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> so that's a, that's a call for it. Um, but yeah, it depends. Um, it can be funded by different academics going for academic research funding bids, um, or it can come from state organisations. I know some of the people that would have done it in the UK, it would have been, you know, things like the 
the funding I got from the Irish Research Council. But um, a really interesting one for people to take note of that was published recently is from, which is, I think is a very doable way of doing it as well, is the Northern Ireland Victim, Victim Support Northern Ireland in February 2021 launched their Court Observers Report where they had lay people attend trials from 2018, 2019. Um, they trained them and they observed trials and that report is a fantastic read and is a very doable way of doing this type of research as well. Okay, um, I, th this one might be more towards Catherine and Leisha in some ways. It's, I'm, I'm not going to read the comment in full, but this is in relation to somebody who has a friend going through the system. Um, and she was told, this woman was told by the courts she couldn't engage in her own counselling during the time of trial. Is this the norm? It's not, the, it's not a fact. But um, Catherine or Leisha, have, have you heard that a lot? No. Is the no, answer. no, okay, no. So, so I'd, we'd like to think that's not the norm. It's not what we've heard, but it is. Um, it is awful to hear that, and it does show the need for further information and advice for yeah. people along the system. Um, and kindly, this somebody, uh, this person also says the the, the national twenty four hour helpline was a, a great support. And just to remind yeah. everyone on the call who needs it as well, there is a national 24 hour helpline for anyone who needs support in relation uh, to sexual offences. Um, so I, I am missing out on a couple of questions, but there will be lots of questions. And I think these are things we will be coming back to, uh, but I'm going to close the seminar here by saying um, a, a very big thank you to Susan Leahy for her thoughtfulness in thinking through this research in the first place, because that's what, that was a large part of it. She had to kind of conceptualize what was needed in this area where such research doesn't exist. She did that. Uh, she was able to source the funding to do it, uh, although the hours of work she put into it would far outweigh the research, but it's so important and its conclusions are very important. So a huge thank you to you, uh, Dr. Susan Leahy, um, and the very best of luck with all that, all that follows on from this. It is, it is a great, um, it, it's a great start in this kind of better understanding of the, of the system. Uh, great thanks as well to Leisha and Catherine for all your work uh, the work you do in the courts and around the courts and, and your championing of the rights of victims. Thank you very much for that. Thank you to all the participants who took part in the research. Um, and, uh, and thank you all very much indeed for coming along to this seminar. As I say, the research is now live on our website, all going well. And this session has been recorded and will be up on our YouTube as soon as possible after this. Maybe not this second, but very shortly afterwards. Uh, we are committed in Dublin Rape Crisis Centre to, to forwarding our mission of preventing the harm and healing the trauma of rape and sexual violence. A big part of it for us is a better system so that those who engage with the criminal justice system um, are able to access the justice that they need to vindicate their rights and that we make for a safer and better society. We are uh, conscious that this work complements work done by the Department of Justice in, in the O'Malley Review and the following on the, the implementation plan for, uh, for implementing the recommendations of that report. And we wish everybody well in that. We are, I mean, it is, a, it is great to see a recognition of the level of harm that can, that can occur for a victim who engages with the criminal justice system, which is their right and which is in all our interest. Um, and it is really important and we can, if we all work together, we definitely can work to make that journey um, a better one, a safer one and a more rights focused one. And with that, I'll let you off and thank you all very much indeed for, uh, for your attendance here for this seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Nolan. Okay. We